Shalom Aleichem Rabbi Sai. This is Yehuda Halevi Levin. The program is Levin at 11, heard each and every Thursday evening, Lel Shishi, from 11 o'clock to midnight, because we are in the midnight hour. And I'm your humble host, Yehuda Levin, with 98% of my brain tied behind my back, just to make it understandable to our goodness Yisrael, the Askonim of Satma, Lubavitch, OU, etc., the Jews in Flatbush, Muncie, Monroe, etc., etc., in order that they should understand the Hashkafas of the Gedoli Yisrael of yesteryear, from whose wellsprings I drank very, very deeply, and whose will and whose uh, marching orders I continue to comply with and to fulfill because I'm an automaton. Usually we speak about morality, but Rabbi say occasionally we've spoken about the tremendous catastrophe we've had on Rav David Eidenson, and I've had various discussions, monologues with the Olam about the tremendous catastrophe of what's going on with Gittin, the wild west of divorce that is becoming so frequent. The statistics are staggering. Unbelievable. Young marrieds are getting divorced and people for married for 40 years are getting divorced. There's no end in sight. The wagon is galloping downhill with the horses are in control. There's no drivers. Now, what motivated this program is it's been international news for the last few weeks that an individual, I think mayor or Yisrael Mayor Kin of California, of, of Nevada, has been in the news because he, uh, his wife, Olana, of the family of Ralbag, has not received a get for 10 or 15 years, and she claims to be an Aguna, and he has been listed in the Jewish press, and he has faced opprobrium and, and uh, loss of jobs and all kinds of stuff. And then his mother passed away, and there was this whole international situation where the chief rabbi, who's her cousin through marriage, became involved and stopped the mother from being buried for a certain amount of time. And this made international news. And now Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Kin, Mrs. Lana Kin, I saw an interview actually appeared on Israeli um, media. During the Shiva, we saw the gangsters from Ora, the organization to resolve Agonot, uh, an ultra left-wing organization that has some YU support, which Rabbi Herschel Schachter, if he hasn't disassociated himself, will have to explain. And they were outside screaming and yelling and commanding during the shiva. So I said, we're going to get the other side of the story because I researched it. And I want to say from the outset, people have said to me, Levin, how could you do a program with Mayor Kin? When you're not hearing two sides, did you speak to Lana King? Efshatakan, maybe this, that, etc., etc. Who knows? She could be the biggest Sadekis since Mother Teresa Lahavdolfi Avdolis. How could you do this? So I want to make it clear she is welcome to come on my program. And if I obtain her phone number, Belin Neda, I will personally call her. And, in, and issue the invitation personally. I don't know how to track her down, but if I find out, I have no problem. If she can explain why she was allowed to do this, that's fine. So without any further ado, uh, speaking to us from the other side of the United States, Reb Mayor Kin, Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom. Reb Mayor, um, you, you both got involved in the Zivik Shani, and it didn't work out. This is a Meissen B'chol Yom, it's not unusual. So it didn't work out. So what Miss, Mrs. Kin said on, on, the, uh, on that, that tape that I saw in the Israeli media, she said they were only together for around three years. And around uh, December of 2004, she decided she wanted to get. You left the house. Uh, you were out of the house in January of 05, Lumis Parham. And you basically told her, threatened her, promised her, indicated her she'll never get a get. What, what happened? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because even... Even if you said such things, we don't know what went on between the two, and people can get upset and say certain things. But it doesn't seem that even if she quoted you as saying such things, 
in the heat of a moment. It's not important. But obviously, what you did afterwards, and I read every step of the of the protocols that Rabbi Gestetner has put out in Lashon HaKodesh, I understand he put it out in English. I read one copy of it. I don't have it in front of me because I'm technologically challenged. It's all on my computers. But I, I, got, I got the halach yelech of the choreography, of the step-by-step, and it seems that you did everything kedasu kedin. So when you moved out in January of 205, who went to court? Okay. Alana uh, went to court from the get-go uh, against halacha, and uh, I tried to convince her to go to Bez, and at that time, I actually gave her a Bezdin that is well-recognized. His name is um, Moshe Gabioff, Evan Hamishpat, Bezdin Evan Hamishpat in Mansi. And I pushed and went to him as a Jew, as a firm Jew, we have to uh, litigate divorce in the Bezdin. And he sent her as Manish to come, and she wouldn't come. And not only that, what happened was she went to court and she obtained a gag order, uh, not allowing me to say certain relevant facts in front of any Bezdin or any court, uh, which would have granted me custody of my son. They're very, uh, very serious matters. And he uh, issued her a letter of warning that if she doesn't remove the gag order, uh, he will put a serve on her. So uh, Lana took that letter from Rabbi Gabi, I've showed it to the judge, and the judge said, uh, Mr. Kin, uh, it looks like you showed the gag order to the rabbi because in the gag order is written what she didn't want anyone to know. And um, at that point, uh, the judge said to me, since you violated the gag order, I give you two choices. Either you voluntarily give up custody or I have to put you in jail. Okay, let me ask you a few questions, Reb Mayer, because I want to tell you, I, I, th- these are my milers in life. I know how to eat. I'm a big schluffer. And a little bit, I know how to communicate just by dint of having done it for 40 years. Basically, I'm on the radio on and off for 37 years. So I want you to understand when you or I or anybody is very involved in their own situation, they tend subconsciously to assume everybody can follow and can follow with the clip that they're going. So I want to slow you down because this is very important that we dissect this and that people understand basically time frameworks, which is very important in halacha. So let's go back again. 2004, December, there, 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 there were the sounds that she wanted a divorce, she was saying. That's what she said. She said you moved out, you were out of the house in January of 05. When did she go to court and in what venue? In New York, in Rockland County, in California? Okay. I, slow, can slow. Give, I cannot give you the exact date of the filing of her divorce, but basically within that, I would say to you like this, in December uh, of 04, I was visiting Israel. Uh, my daughter was learning in seminary. Upon my return, she already filed, she handed me, served me with divorce papers literally within a day or two of, of my return of Israel. How did you get out of the house? Did you leave voluntarily? Did she have you thrown out? Uh, How did that at happen? At that time, I, I believe I left voluntarily because I knew that if I wouldn't leave voluntarily, things would escalate uh, as it happens in a lot of divorces where the women get you know, orders of protection and these kind of things. I suspected something like that was going to happen, so I voluntarily left. At that time, your child, according to what she said today, was approximately three years old. Um, he was actually, yeah, you're right, three years old. Okay. Uh, um, uh-huh. Now, the court that she served you in, where were you living then? Where was the, the residence? Where, what state was and that in? I was living, when I was served the papers, I was living in the marital residence, which was in Muncie, New York. And the court was the, the Rockland County Supreme Court is where she filed. Now, what, now the, 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 this, I, I'm a bit familiar in a general way because I want to tell the Oilam that in 1991, um, Dove Wallowitz, a very well-known uh, philanthropist from, uh, from uh, the five towns, from Lawrence actually, hired me to run an organization which I named Get Free. At that time, I, I, I didn't know much, and I thought all the women are poor agonists and all the men are cavemen, like Ronald Reagan said, we'd all be cavemen, et cetera, et cetera. And I was hired, I was hired, and I still maintain until this very day 
Mamish, the better part of 30 years, a phone number, 718-NYC, New York City, get one. I'm listed with Shalom Task Force, which is a liberal pro-woman organization that has a shelter. And over the years, women have called me up for guidance with the Besan system. So somebody cannot accuse me of blindly being pro-men in all cases, because that's not the case. I've helped men. I've helped women. There's no charge for that. I continue to keep the phone, even though I left that employee literally in 1993 or so. Having, having said that, I very seldom ever hear of such a situation that, uh, that somebody should impose, that a judge should impose at the beginning. They might seal records at a certain point, but to impose a gag order is quite unusual. How, how long into the proceedings did that happen? Was it after a year or two? Was it after a few months? It seems and the way it happened, okay, here's the way it happened. When she filed the Supreme Court, which is a divorce court, um, the judge there actually, I, I, my lawyer made it clear that there was some suspicious activity that she was involved with with computers in the home that was very relevant to a custody uh, trial. And the judge uh, was very interested, and he actually ordered Lana to hand over to my forensic examiner such computers for examination without deleting. Uh, she subsequently deleted files there, which was recreated by my uh, examiner. Uh, my attorney at that point pointed out to her attorney that we found damning evidence in there. Basically, she's probably gonna lose custody. And what happened at that point is her lawyer dismissed the entire divorce petition because in order to present the evidence, we would have to show it at trial. So if you would dismiss the petition, there is no trial. So I ask you, Rabbi Huda, have you ever heard of a woman who files for divorce once again and dismisses a divorce petition without reconciliation with her husband? Never so, heard of something like that, right? So if, if Only you're right. I, I got you. So if it only happened in this case because she was hiding evidence. We understand. Oh. Out to the forefront. Okay. We don't have to. We 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 we've got that picture. We've got that picture. We don't want to stelzach on this a lot, but we want to move on to the next thing. So what happened is as follows: before she removed her uh, case from the court, you had already sent her a hasmana from Rabbi Moshe Gaviyov, who I think I know, who's an Odom yeah. Choshev from the Gaviyov family in Muncie. Correct. Uh, I, I know him. He has a brother, Yehuda Gaviyov, in, in Borough Park, who used to own a hat store. Uh, we know the Gaviyovs. Their father, their father was somebody Choshev in Chinuch or whatever. I, maybe even in a Machanich. I can't remember exactly. But anyhow, so you sent to Azmona. At that time, she was still in court. And in other words, at what point did the judge say to you, e because you violated the gag order, either you're going, or in his mind, you're going to either go to jail or surrender custody of your child, irregardless of whether there's a divorce or not? Let me, let me clarify. There's two separate judges. The judge with the computers with the Supreme Court judge, he did not place a gag order. Once Lana dismissed her divorce petition in Supreme Court, she then jumped immediately to a different court called the Family Court, right, of Rockland County, in order to quickly get custody and control the situation. It is in that court that she convinced a judge to put a gag order on me, and it was that judge in family court who said, um, either you give up custody or I put you in jail for violating a gag order and speaking to your rabbi. Is that now approximately, remember now, uh -huh. this thing started in around January when you came back from Eretz Yisrael, January of O'Fallon Misparum. Approximately how many months later were you given that ultimatum? I cannot tell you the exact dates of when she, uh, uh, I think it was, I don't know, maybe six months later. All right, let's uh, say when June. When she went to one court and went to the other, I don't have the exact Okay, date. but it was within the year. It was within that year. If she started in yeah. January, it was June or it was July or August. It was within that. It, right. It was dancing right. around. And it happened after she, 
jumped out of, I, I believe, one court. She went into the next court. Now, the next court didn't know, you know, uh, whatever. It, they didn't know what was going on exactly. They just kind of... Now, now that judge, her. would you Bye. say, now, would you say that that judge in family court, who you feel might not have even known the, uh, the depth, the comprehensiveness of whatever transgress or trespass might have appeared in, in, in those computers or whatever it is or whatever your claim was, does that judge, do you feel that that judge, like what motivated him to come down so hard? Was uh, he... The difference is the judge in Supreme Court was a man. The judge in family court was a woman. Is that lady still in courts today? No. I don't think she's there today anymore. I think she was transferred to another court. I see. And were you were never able to appeal that gag order with that whole business? And to no. I, 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 to, to be honest with you, I, I mean, I could have tried to appeal it, but she was hitting me with so much litigation. I didn't want to go and spend the money to appeal that. Uh, so basically, just, basically, I, okay, basically, basically, so in effect... When they did this to you, when they gave her custody, when this woman, yeah. judge, did she say she's guaranteeing you visitation, and etc., like a normal parent? Um, she gave me, yeah, she gave me a set visitation, um, but... You know, it, 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 I definitely was not happy with that arrangement because part of the reason why, getting back to what you were saying, why I believe Alana even filed for divorce was in an effort to, to conceal this activity with the computers, which I didn't want because it was harmful to the children. So I really uh, have to say that um, I did not think it was, it was the visitation schedule was, was good in such a situation. But basically, again, I don't want to. I don't want to stelzich on this. I don't want to emphasize this too much. We're going to move on in another half a moment. But I just want to understand: Did you basically lose your relationship with your son, and how long after the beginning of visitation did that that situation terminate that you could no longer or did no longer have any relationship with the son that you fathered with? Uh, with Mrs. Uh, Mr. Albag uh, Kin. Well, I've had visitation for many years with him, but you have to understand that at a young age, the women today manipulate visitations in many different ways. So I can't tell you, let's put it this way, Yehuda, I was divorced prior from another marriage. I just want to give you a comparison. In my prior divorce, which is extremely amicable, my ex-wife gave me very much open visitation. Whenever you want to see the kids, see the kids. There wasn't any restrictions placed. In this situation, there was a, there was a restrictions placed. And it pushed it, you know, with men who spend a lot of money in litigation, it's not worth going back and forth to court uh, uh, because she was supposed to give me visitation and this young kid, and she changed her mind. Right, right. I, wanna, I, 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 got, I got it. I want to say yeah. this to the Olam that we're educating. Every time a person steps into a court, if a lawyer today, let's say, is charging two fifty or three hundred dollars an hour, that's kemat an average price. It could be for a good lawyer. It could be even significantly higher. The lawyers claim that they have a certain amount of time they prepare. They come down to the courtroom. They have to wait to be seen. The clock is ticking. Any visit to a court. For the slightest thing, you're talking fifteen hundred to to two and a half thousand dollars for 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 nothing, for bupkis, for 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 nothing of 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 serious consequence. And therefore, what Mayor Kin is explaining is that that the system with the visitation, the custody, the children, who's generally uh, by the mother and the father is considered the interloper, the guests, that we deign, noblesse oblige, to give him a little bit time with the kid. He is the pursuer at great finances, which makes it very difficult. Now, today, this young man is now 17, 18 years old, 16, 17, 18. Do you have a shaykhus with him today? No. She cut 
me off from him um, almost a year ago. <laughs> and at the time, one more question, because it's important that people should understand this. When you would see him until a year ago, did he ever carry messages to you? Or did he ever use part of his visitation time with you to say, Ta, you're evil, you're holding mommy a prisoner? Any of that kind of stuff go on or it was stayed away from? No, he never told that to me, but it was evident from his behaviors when he came to visit me that he was tainted by uh, things that he heard at home against me. It was, ev it was evident in there. They so were alienated from me. So this, this concept, which is called parental alienation, this exists, which means fractionally, sometimes 25%, sometimes 50 sometimes 75%, depending upon the mother, the woman, the family of the mother, the support system. But we have to understand, when a child is in the custodial care of one parent, particularly a mother, mother's milk, etc., etc., we have to understand that there is a predisposition that, that the kid already is partial, and he doesn't understand why it is that his mother is, a, is, 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 is quote unquote, a prisoner, and the father is getting remarried and living, and therefore the child becomes alienated and becomes very, very upset with the, with the, with the father. And I say that you can, in a perfect world, you can divorce a spouse if it's according to halacha, but the, the divorcing the child from the uh, parent is another avla which no parent, father or mother, has the right to do. And, and that is an extreme, that in itself, in different cases, is an extreme reason that a father who's not strictly halachically obligated to give a get, if he sees that these kinds of shtiklach are being made, then that is a reason for a father to say, I am not interested in noblesse oblige doing something if there's not a chay of lakasha when you are divorcing me from my child. But I don't want to, again, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I, I think people could contemplate what I'm saying. So now the question is like this. Uh, when she went out of court and she went to family court for the, the gag order, she got that gag order from a family court ju ju judge, a woman who didn't even fully understand, perhaps, or know the full implications of, of what was going on there. D d d d d and, and you had to surrender voluntarily custody. And you say it would have been too costly in litigation. As long as you were getting visitation, you felt the chances of overturning the custody with the gag order and everything else could have costed you maybe five, tens of thousands of dollars. And therefore, you made a choice that, that you couldn't afford to do that because she was probably doing other things to you in court, as you mentioned, litigation. So, right. She, uh, she had endless funds from her father to pay for very costly attorneys and uh, litigations, and I did not. And I did not have the funds to uh, to go after, especially, it is, like you said, you're educating your, your public. Today, family court is very anti-man. The way it's set up, it's very anti-man. And uh, it, it's very costly for men to go fight and expect to win just because of the way that these courts are have been feminized. And it's just that's the reality of things. Now, how how long now when 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 you let if you have in front of you the Rabbi Gestetner protocol, that means the hierarchy, the step by step. I don't have it in front of me. I know it yeah. about 80 percent. I know it. You know, I saw it. But yeah. if you could spend even the next two or three minutes reading the step by step in English, sure. if you want, of Lashna Kodesh, people should understand what happened. Okay. Okay. And by the way, I just want to tell you, the, the Rabbi Gabioff, what happened was when she did not remove the gag order, and remember, the Rabbi Gabioff explained to her the reason why the gag order is terrible is because every Jewish man in the world is allowed by laws of the Torah to express himself freely in front of a Din Torah. He's got to see what's going on in the household. But if the other side is forcibly gagging him, he can't possibly have a fair Din Torah 
anywhere. So he said to her, if you don't remove it, I will put a serif on you. And he did. He put a serif on her. Well, ultimately, he removed it because he got pressure, but he didn't put a serif. Okay, let me get back he, and give you what the, the result what, what, what he says here. Yeah, go ahead. He mentioned, he mentioned here that on December 14, 2004, she petitioned the Rockland Supreme Court for divorce proceedings, which we already mentioned. Then it says here on January 5th of 2005, I contacted Rabbi Gabriel's Evan Hamish for the Desmond. And um, let's see. And then he mentions about the gag order. Uh, on the, right. And then there is a letter that I received on November 4th from 2005, a letter from three rabbis that knew me, that gave testimony that I tried my best to settle our affairs and give her a get, and that she was stubborn and did not agree. Okay, I, I want to stop you. I want to stop you. This is a ve By me, this is a very important piece of evidence. It seems to me that you, you is it possible that these were Lubavitcher rabbis? No. The no, the two of them had shoes in my area and one in a different area. Okay, so that's in Muncie, in Rockland County. In Muncie, yeah. So now, now in the ensuing years, this is very important. Where did these three individuals disappear to? Why is it that they have not continued a color de la Pusik? Why haven't they said, listen, Herzegain, we stand by what we said then. Yeah. You know, where, where are they? Where are they? Answer is, this is exactly what the crux of the problem with the rabbis today, which I also speak a lot about. There is three kinds of rabbis today. There are the evil rabbis. They are, and then there's the very good rabbis that do what they're supposed to, and then there's the middle kind, which are the, the silent rabbis. The majority of rabbis, I call them the silent rabbis. What I mean is, they're afraid to stand up because what I found happened, you know, this is very important what I'm about to tell you. People ask me all the time, can we see the signatures of your head mayor of We want to see who. The reason why I've never released the signatures is because I was warned. Right, right, right. When you release the signature and you show Correct. people these Rabbanim get threats from the rabbinic mafia, and therefore these men are threatened to the point that they will never help another man again. And therefore, in order to put a stop to that, I do not reveal those signatures. Uh, it doesn't make a difference to me whether people believe my second marriage was, was a kosher or not. It's irrelevant. I'm not required to show them signatures so I should get their stamp of approval. But I'm telling you why they ask for it. Right. They don't ask for it for correct reasons. They ask right. for it to harass these rabbis. So therefore, when you ask me again, where are these rabbis today? They don't want to be too vocal. Because the more vocal you become, the more threats you get. You get. I want to. I want to. Story of rabbis today. I want to. I want to add something. The Chavetz Chaim says, "Lashon Hara, Tarmanitaren." You're not allowed to hear slander. Lashon Hara. Ober, but a nar, a fool, a simpleton, darfman design. You don't have to be foolish in not hearing Lashon Hara. Now, today we have a problem with women's dress and sneers. The problem is not in the five towns. The problem is not only in Queens. The problem is in Borough Park. It's certainly in Flatbush. And it's even to a certain extent in the Heilige Erta, there are more and more problems with sneers because there's a feminization that's going on and a, and a lack of values. Therefore, if you look at pictures of the women, American secular Gentile women in the 1950s, they dress, in many cases, the Gentiles, more sneistic than the people who do the promenade with the fancy